All right, for our message this morning, I want to kind of pick up where I left off last week. I want to take us back to last week a little bit so that we can tie these two messages together. Last week and this week, we're working on a two-week teaching series called It's Personal. And last week, for those of you who were here, you might recall I I started off sharing a story about myself. And I said, well, I'm going to talk about myself. I don't want you to listen to, to me in the story, but I want you to pay attention to the people, the other people who are in the story, because those were people who stepped into my life at pivotal decision-making moments in my life. And whether it was a guidance counselor back in high school, whether it was two of my teachers when I was at uh, Lakeshore Tech in Wisconsin, or whether it was at Western Michigan, or whether it was 20 years later in seminary, and how certain people came alongside of me and leaned into me and poured into me, people who didn't have to do that, These were people who were not necessarily responsible for me, nor was I necessarily directly responsible to them, but people who just loved me and maybe saw potential in me and took an interest in me, and then I shared the difference that that had made on my life. And I shared with all of you how that's what we are to do as a church, how each one of us is to lean into somebody and pour that encouragement into them. That's part of what it means to be a Christian, to be Jesus, to do what Jesus did to make a difference in the lives of people. And I shared how Jesus' ministry was largely a one-on-one ministry, unless he was teaching to the multitudes. If you look at the Gospels, so much of Jesus' ministry was talking or working with one person at a time. And you look at how those people were changed. We're going to look at that again this morning in our text. But to build the bridge to get there, what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to just share that text I shared last week from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And as I shared last week, Hebrews 10 comes right before chapter 11. That usually happens, 10 before 11, right? (laughs) 11 is the heroes of the faith chapter. And you get this long list of people throughout the Old and New Testament who were labeled as heroes of the faith. But before you get to chapter 11, you have this chapter 10, which is written much like a message or a sermon would be to a congregation. And it says, this is what you must do. This is, this is an, an exhortation, an urge or an appeal to faithfulness, if you will. And then that following chapter says, here's, here's the people, here's the example of these faithful people. But what did, what's part of what those faithful people did? You go back one chapter, look at the context of chapter 10, and it says this. Starting in 23, again, Hebrews 10. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering. And I didn't didn't stress that a whole lot last week. And as I looked over that again this week and this morning, I thought, this is just a good reminder to us this morning. It says, let us hold on tightly to our faith without wavering or affirm the faith, the hope that we have. And I just want to stress that again. You know, there's so much going on in our world, isn't there? I talked to somebody this week, and they said, we just don't watch the news anymore. We just don't watch the news because it's so disheartening. Many of you go, amen, right? I'm not sure it's good to not know what's going on. I think it's okay to know what's going on. But it's also, this text is a reminder that says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. You know what? It, It matters who's president It matters who's in charge of the world, but you know what? Ultimately, God is in charge, isn't he? And that's the hope that we have. Let us hold tightly that. Let's never forget the hope we have. And in the New Testament, doesn't it tell us that we have a living hope that will never perish, spoil, or fade that's kept for us in heaven? Don't get caught up, too caught up in this world because we're not staying here. When I look at that text, it's a reminder to say, don't just get so focused on what's happening here. Make sure we have our minds and our heads in the right places, our feet on the ground, but our our eyes and our hands lifted up because the best is yet to come. Let us hold on to that. Don't let the world drag you down, but hold on to the hope that we have. It says, for God can be trusted to his promises. Amen? And verse 24 says, let us think of, and this is where we started in this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think, it says. It doesn't say do at that point. It says, let us think. Let us ruminate. Let us ponder. 
Then verse 25 says, let us not neglect meeting together. And that's one of my prayers for all of us. Let's never stop meeting together on Sundays. Let's never make Sunday more convenience than commitment. Do you hear me? God puts us in this place for a reason. To encourage one another, to love one another, to make a commitment to each other. And part of our commitment is to be present, to keep worshiping. Let us never neglect our meeting together as some people do, he says. But then he says, but encourage one another. Encourage one another. Those things that you thought about to motivate one another, those acts of love and good works, now he says, put them into action. Encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. The hope we have, think of ways, and then do them, he says. Why? You take all of those verses, why? Because the day of Christ is drawing near. Then one of the things I shared is as a church member, we should never be saying, should I be involved? The question is, where am I going to be involved? Where can I serve? Right? I talked about one, 1 Corinthians 12. I talked about one body, many parts. And then I said, because we're focusing last week and this week on filling some spots in our youth ministry and our children's ministry, I said, what if every child, what if every young person, all the way through college, let's just say, okay? Not that anybody over college isn't young. But anybody through college, let's just say from, from the nursery through, through college, what if every single person that was connected to this church, every one of those that fall into that age category, had somebody other than their parents or a teacher, but somebody in this church just leaning into them and taking an interest in them and loving them. Stepping in at that pivotal, pivotal moment in their life, encouraging them or seeing them for who they are or maybe recognizing some of the challenges they're going through and stepping in and saying, I'm with you in this. Or I'm here for you in this. Wouldn't you want to have that? That's our job as Christians. That's our job as a church. And this morning I want to look at that again, but I want to, last week I shared the story from Hebrews. We looked at 23 through 25 and talked about the hope, talked about the encouragement, the deeds, and then doing these things. This morning I want to look at an example. I want to look at an example. I said before, Jesus' ministry was largely one-on-one. -on -one. I want to look at a story of Jesus' one-on-one -on -one ministry, a familiar story to many of you. And I want to look at this morning is what happens when Jesus shows up. What happens when you and I are Jesus and really show up, if you will? If I back up, what we talked about is it's personal, right? That's what the banners or the bulletin boards are. And when I say it's personal, what I'm really saying is to go deeper. To go deeper in a relationship. It's one thing to be shallow. It's one thing to go into the grocery store or the bank and say to the teller, the teller says, how are you? You say, I'm fine, I'm doing good, have a good weekend, right? That's shallow. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That can be a good thing when you want to move on. But if you really want to step into somebody's life and know what's going on, you've got to go deeper than hello or how are you or goodbye or have a good weekend. And I think sometimes when we look at people, I mean, let's be honest, right? We look at people and sometimes you look at them and you think, I know there's something going on in their life. There's something that just doesn't seem right or doesn't look right. Or when I look at them, they look different than they did last week. And sometimes we just go, hey, I'll pray for you, or how you doing, right? And sometimes I think we just got to stop and say, what's going on? And call them by name. Another reason why, and I'm looking around, I'm not going to pinpoint, me, but if you don't have a name tag on, make sure we're wearing name tags, there's, and I'm going to go back to this. There's something about wearing a name tag when you can call a person by name. There's definitely something about this, and we're going to look at what Jesus did, okay? Let's look at the story. Get to the point, right? Before I do that. If you look at the context of Scripture, it was all about religion, wasn't it? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rules. I, I wish I had more time to go into this this morning, but if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look at Jesus' ministry, it was always the religious up against relationship. The religious were all about dotting the I's, crossing the T's, making sure that everything was theologically sound and right. And Jesus was all about relationships. 
to be specific with that, Jesus really ministered in a very religiously impersonal culture, didn't he? They didn't go deep in their relationships with each other. They made it about things, not the heart. And Jesus changes that. I think when Jesus shows up, Jesus shows up in a way that says, God and a relationship with God is more, much more than religion. This is a personal thing. This is all about relationship. This is a heart thing, not necessarily a head thing. And that comes through so clearly in the story of Zacchaeus. I want you to look at the story with me from Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. I know what some of you are thinking right now. You want to sing it? You know the song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that day, he looked up in the tree. And what did he say? Zacchaeus, you come down. Some of you are wondering, where is this coming from, right? You never heard this, right? But he says, Zacchaeus, you come down. Why? From going to your house today. Listen to the rest of this story, and then we'll digest this thing. We'll pick it apart. It says, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was short. He couldn't see over the crowd, so he ran and climbed up the sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Maybe a familiar story to some. It's an incredible story, and I hope you'll go back and look at it again and kind of work through this thing, because there's a lot that's going on here. When you think about it, Zacchaeus was a well-known tax collector who had cheated people out of all of their money. If you were one of the townspeople in that day and you saw Zacchaeus, would you run up to Zacchaeus and have a shallow relationship or a deep relationship? You might just say, hey, Zach, I don't think he's, hey, Zacchaeus, how's the tax business, right? This is a notorious guy who cheated everybody in the town out of their money. He was not accepted. He was more rejected than accepted, wasn't he? I think when people saw Zacchaeus, they could have given a rip about him. They probably went the other way because they're thinking, if we get to know him too well and he finds out I have a little bit of means, he's going to take that too. It says not only was he a tax collector, but Zacchaeus was a wealthy tax collector, a notorious tax collector, and obviously he cheated a lot of people out of a lot of money. And one day when Jesus is coming to town, he wanted to get a glimpse of who Jesus was, but he was short. I guess I can relate to that. When you're in a crowd, it's hard to see above everybody else, right? Right? So he climbs up in the tree, and when Jesus sees him, he doesn't say, hey, you up in the tree, get out of there before you fall. He says, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, is that you? Come on down. You're the next person. <laughs> Come on down out of your tree, and let's talk, Zacchaeus. And let's not just talk here on the road, but Zacchaeus, I'm going to go to your house. Let's sit down and really have a conversation, Zacchaeus. Let's talk about life. Let's do life. Let's have a meal. Let's talk about things together. 
And Zacchaeus, who maybe wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus, has got to be going, you've got to be kidding me. He not only sees me, but he knows me by name. And not only does he know me by name, but he says, come on down out of the tree. And I think we're just going to shake hands and he's going to get going. He goes, no, I'm going to your house. How do you think Zacchaeus, the rejected, neglected, criminal sinner, felt when Jesus saw him not as the person who he was, but the person whom he could become? Do you think Zacchaeus' life was changed? And Zacchaeus, if you notice in the story, said he wanted to see Jesus when Jesus was coming by, but when Jesus acknowledged him, Zacchaeus said, Lord, Lord. You see what happened there? There was transformation, wasn't there? Huge transformation in Zacchaeus' life. Before climbing the tree, Zacchaeus lost his sense of identity. I don't think he really knew who he was. He didn't know if he was good or bad. Nobody probably paid a whole lot of attention to him because they were afraid of what he was going to do, take more of their money. Before climbing the tree, he lost his sense of belonging. I don't know that he necessarily had a circle to hang with unless there were other bad tax collectors. But all of a sudden, Jesus said, you belong in my circle. We're going to talk. We're going to your house today. And maybe before climbing the tree, maybe he even lost his sense of purpose, but Jesus gave him hope. Jesus showing up showed him that somebody cared. Somebody made time for him. I think Zacchaeus was a different person after Jesus met with him, don't you? I got to believe when Jesus showed up in his life when nobody else would really maybe make time for him or, or, or take time in a healthy way to understand Zacchaeus and really understand his life, his struggles, his world, and to tell him who he really was and to give him a second chance or to bring hope into his life, I think Zacchaeus was totally changed. And if you look at the story, it says that because it says, if I've cheated anybody, he says, I'm going to give it back. He says, even four times I'm going to give back. I got to believe that the people there were wondering after Zacchaeus did this, like, what happened to him? What happened? Imagine getting four times your money back if you were cheated. How does that happen? It happens when Jesus shows up, doesn't it? It happens when Jesus shows up. You know what the real beauty of the story is? Put all of the details aside. But at the bottom line, the story says, salvation came to Zacchaeus that day. Isn't that what it's about? Isn't that what it's about? Making sure that everyone gets saved and is in heaven. Isn't that what the cross is about? You want to talk about going deep. Jesus went deep. All the way to the depths of hell and died. For one. Every one of us. Didn't he? Do you see the beauty of the story? Do you see the difference that one person can make? in the life of another. You and I have no idea the potential we have, the impact we have in whatever we're doing to influence somebody else's life. And I think we need to be reminded of that this morning. Jesus stepped in and made it personal and went deeper. You know, when I think about our next generation, specifically this morning, and I think every one of us, I mean, if you just stop and just, just look around you, don't stare, but just look around you, how well do you really know the people sitting around you? How well do you really know what they're going through? If I asked you, and don't raise your hands, but if I asked you how many of you really feel alone, that nobody really understands what you're going through? I'll bet they're within arm's reach. 
See what I'm saying this morning? Every one of us has the opportunity to lean into somebody. We need each other. We were meant not just to gather together, but to get together and to get into each other's lives in a healthy way to make a difference. Every single one of us around us needs somebody to lean into us and just love us where we're at and give us encouragement and give us hope like Jesus did. That's transformational. That's transformational. And specifically, again, this morning, I look at it and I say, our youth, our youth live in a world where, as I said last week, everything is permissible, per se, but it's not good, is it? And we're told everybody has to make a choice for themselves. And I know I got a little wound up last week, right? And then it started thundering and lightning and everything else, and I said, I'll quit preaching up a storm, right? But our kids, our kids live in a world where unless they're hearing it in their homes, unless they're hearing it from the pulpit, or even in their schools, it's difficult for them to distinguish what's good and bad because so many things as Christians that we believe aren't right are so well accepted in this culture we live in. And I talked about how we need to teach them God's ways, and I talked before about rules and I, you know, the Ten Commandments, right? And what God expects of us. And these are things that aren't there to, to hold us back from, from life or having any fun, but these are the things that liberate us. These are the things that give us life and enable us to have a richer, fuller life. Now, what if I look at those, the younger kids who are in those pivotal years, those, those early decision-making years, making life and career choices, faith choices? What if they had somebody to lean into them in a way that's not their parents, that's not necessarily their teacher, but just somebody from the church that made a difference in their life and poured into them? I think it would make a huge difference. The choices they make aren't going to be resolved by just taking them or dragging them to church if we're not living it at home. Sometimes we get caught up in worship, right? Our preference of worship songs. Our worship songs aren't necessarily going to lead our kids to make a difference in their faith choices. Or maybe some of you are going to disagree with me on that. A, a deeper Bible study, more material isn't necessarily going to lead them into making good faith decisions. What I'm saying is, people don't care how much you know. People want to know how much you care. Does that make sense? We can talk and we can talk and we can talk, but it doesn't mean anything if we really don't take an interest in them. So what am I saying? I'm saying, show up, go deeper. Go deeper. Show them what life is about. Show them what God's, are, God's ways are about. And if you think you have to be perfect to do that, let me, let me, let me just say no. God, God doesn't use perfect, there are no perfect people, right? I just believe that God puts us in places and times with people for reasons, and I'm saying, if, if we look around us within arms, we see these people, we see we can make the difference. The, the, the question is, are we really willing to do it? Are we willing to get involved? Are we w really willing to get dirty and get messy? See, to me, a messy church is a healthy church. Because when we deal with the messes and we deal with what's going on in each other's lives, we get real, don't we? I don't want to pretend I've been in too many churches, and, and if you don't like what I say, then I'm sorry, but there's too many churches that, that put on the mask and, and pretend everything is good when it's not good. Christianity is not, a, is not something we put on a mask and we pretend. Jesus didn't pretend. Jesus laughed and partied and turned water into wine. When Jesus cried, he wept when his friends died, didn't he? Jesus did life. Jesus walked in on people when the world walked out on them. Jesus knew how to do church. Jesus washed the disciples' feet to 
took on the lowliest task of a servant, and when he was done, he said, now that you know these things, now that you've seen these things, now that I've shown you how to do these things, he says, you'll be blessed if you do them. Get messy. Get messy. Go deep. You can't mess up messiness when God's in the mess. What happened to Zacchaeus when Jesus stepped in and made it personal? That's question number one. And there's ten. No, I'm kidding. What happened to, G- what happened to Zacchaeus when Jesus stepped in? But here's the more important question. Not that that's not an important question. But maybe this is the applicable question of the morning. What happens to the person within arm's reach of you this morning or around you this week, wherever you are? What happens to that person when you step in and bring them just a little bit of Jesus? (laughs) Do you think you can make a difference? Do you think you can show the world a little bit of who Jesus is by showing up when you don't have to? And when you have nothing to gain, that's the best time to show up when you have nothing to gain. Maybe some people were nice to Zacchaeus so that he wouldn't tax them out of everything. I don't know. But I think the best thing is when you have nothing to gain and you just give it away. That's Jesus. Whether it's a child, a youth, or an adult, go deeper and make it personal. I'm going to invite Lisa to come up this morning because we have a growing children's ministry. You know that. There's a number of, I mean, there's like, a couple of weeks ago, there were like 16 kids in the nursery. And I know there's more babies on the way. And maybe there's more than I even know about. Maybe so. But I know we need a lot of help in that area. And Lisa's going to give you a few of those challenges this morning, focusing specifically on the children's ministry. Family ministry. Good morning. All right. So we've been hearing a lot about relationships. Um, And I just want to say this church is a wonderful relationship-building place. Um, But when we think of our youth, I want to emphasize there's a reason why relationships are so important for them within the church. Um, A lot of people, and you hear a lot um, in the church community about how much our youth are leaving the church. Um, And if I asked you all to raise your hand if you're concerned with that, I think we would probably have a lot of hands up. Um, but statistically speaking, with those people who um, check into the reasoning behind why youth are leaving the church, it's because they don't have any relationships built within the church from older adults. So this is why um, we are working hard to um, make in spirit a place where each child and young person feels that they belong. But we also need it to be a place where they feel like they have someone who they have a relationship with. So um, we need someone and we need somewhere. And we work hard on those environments. um, And you all are the someones that we need uh, to come along beside these youth people. So I just want to highlight a few of what our current needs still are. Starting with Ignite Youth Ministries, which is middle schoolers and high schoolers. And um, Amy Vanderlaan um, is the um, youth ministries director here in Spirit. And um, we have a huge need for one male high school youth group leader, small group leader, and one female um, small group leader in the middle school, and one male middle school um, leader. Once again, some of this is due to growth. Some of this is due to... um, one of our leaders not able to come back who was a small group leader last year. As a small group leader, whether it's youth group or any of them, um, basically you get the lesson from the um, coordinator and it's pretty well, you, you read through it, you get to know it, and you just sit and um, build relationships and go deeper into the lesson that, that was given. Um, and all the material and all the lessons and all the trainings and everything I provided. So. Um, High school group leaders, once again, to speak into our middle schoolers and high schoolers, Ignite Youth Ministries. Um, Next, we also have a need, if I could have the next 
slide in the elementary. Uh, we really could use um, one more large group leader, and don't let that scare you. That just means you kind of do deliver the, the main lesson. Um, but once again, it's very, um, you get everything you need, um, and it's not a big, threatening, scary thing. It's just a lot of fun. That's the other reason to join us, because we are the funnest place to volunteer in all of Inspirit Church is in family ministry. Um, so you get great relationships with that, too. Um, I, I'm, we're starting a new environment. We're pulling fourth and fifth graders out of our elementary room, and we're starting a new environment, which is why you see that wall going up in the um, family room, because that is now going to be our new preteen environment for fourth and fifth graders. And this year, it's a rather small group of, of um, people, and it's boys, two of them or three of them. But I really need two more male small group leaders. Um, it's great with these boys, young boys, if we can have males who are speaking into their life other than their fathers. Nothing against you guys, fathers. But um, And then I could use some more small group leaders um, just in general in the elementary environment. And our AV and tech help people. And don't let those fancy words scare you because basically it means you push a button on the computer to advance the PowerPoint slideshow. So it's very easy, and really anybody sixth grade and up, um, we can find a place for you. Um, and then in the uh, preschool, once again, as Randy mentioned, we have huge growth in the preschool class. So we're going from only one helper in there to two helpers every week. Um, the good news is I, we don't really need six anymore, but we'll take them. But we for sure need at least two or three more um, helpers. But we also have a leader who's moving up to the pre-K or to the elementary. So we do need um, one or two group leaders in the pre-K class. And same thing with that. Uh, Trisha heads that up, Trisha Hayes. And um, she does a great job of giving you everything that you need. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. So um, I think that's all the slides I have. We actually are. I want to thank those of you who have signed up. Um, the good news is our child check-in is all filled. Our nursery helpers are all doing great. Um, so thank you to those who have already signed up. Um, the Orange team will be meeting you out back, and we'd love to talk to any one of you, every one of you, and see where we can get you plugged in um, or answer any questions if you're just not sure. But um, looking forward to talking to you all. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Lisa. So it can be as simple as pushing buttons. And some of you are good at pushing buttons. <laughs> Seriously, see Lisa or the Orange Team after church, okay? It might sound a little complicated with all that's there, but a number of opportunities, a number of people are needed. Let me just say two things to finish up the text here, finish up the message. Number one is, I think what's really important to understand here too in there, and this is something that's totally, maybe aside from what I've said before, but I love the fact that Jesus loves those who haven't followed his ways. Zacchaeus was a notorious sinner, and salvation came to his house that day. Zacchaeus lived his life in, as some would say, not a reputable way. He wasn't a favored person. He wasn't in the kingdom, so to speak, was he? He wasn't a really good guy, right? And Jesus just extended that grace. He loved him where he was, and that day salvation came to his house. I think that's awesome. There's a message in that for all of us, that Jesus loves you no matter where you are. He loves you just the way you are, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. When Jesus steps in, he has a way of transforming us, doesn't he? Through his ways and through his word. Be reminded that Jesus loves you no matter where you are. huh? And that salvation can come to your house today. If you ask him into your heart, he'll come to your house today too. And secondly is obviously the challenge for children's ministry. I want to say thank you to all of you who are serving so generously and have served, but I want to raise the challenge this morning. If God's nudging you, just let him stop nudging. Just say yes. Just step in and, and see the orange team, okay, and be a part of that. This morning I want to finish up our time with, uh, by celebrating the Lord's Supper. And again, I said it before, I think the ultimate example of going deeper is somebody who is willing to literally invest their life, lay down their life so that we might have life. That's the example that you and I have to follow. That's Jesus dying for every one of us, loving us where we are and taking our sins away, giving us a clean slate, letting us start over 
and gives us that promise of eternal life in heaven for all those who believe. So this morning, if you are a believer, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've made him king of your life, and you are sorry for your sins, then I want to invite you to come and participate this morning in the sacrament of communion. It's a time where we remember that night when Jesus was with his disciples before he went to the cross, and he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples during that meal, and he said this was his body, and it was going to be offered for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And after the meal, Jesus took a cup, and he told his disciples that that cup was a sign of a new covenant, that his blood was going to be shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. And we're offering that this morning for each of you to come and take, eat, and drink. Remember that the body of Christ was offered for our sins. So I'm going to invite those who are uh, serving communion this morning to come up, and then I'm going to invite you by rows to come up, or by sections. So those who are serving, if you'll come up. And then just come up by rows, and we will serve you this morning.